This is the Story Punks podcast, a show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. I'm your host, Cindy Grigg. This is episode 21. We're talking about steampunk with Nisi Shawl. Nisi's work also incorporates cyberpunk and solar punk, as well as the broader term of hope punk. And she likes to describe her work with the term Afro retrofuturism and alt history. So there is so much going on here, plenty for anyone who's interested in the punks. You see Shaw's work, Everfair, it takes us to the Congo and some of the conflicts there, and she creates some different outcomes uh, fueled by the technology and many other forces. So absolutely fascinating. This is alternate history at its finest, if you ask me. So very excited about that. But first, let me catch you up on what I'm working on. It's actually more of the same, so I'll keep it pretty short. But I have been incorporating more of my travels to Bolivia for my own deco punk novel that I am finalizing. It'll be ready for beta reading soon. And I'm 92% sure that book one is called Hives of the Halcyon. And I am absolutely sure the book series is called The Salt Sheen Paradox, a deco punk thriller. Book one is 1920s deco punk mixed with 2010s now punk. And you can read this at cindygrig.com, C-I-N-D-Y-G-R-I-G-G.com. The thing that stood out to me at this stage, as I'm really getting towards the end, is how this work is paralleling my own journey to Bolivia more than any other travel experience I've had. So I've been calling this a a research expedition because I get so much out of actually going on site and experiencing the area in that way. And I think even more so with Bolivia than any other place I've been, because there just isn't as much online about this area. It is becoming more popular as a travel destination. And that's all really good. And you can definitely go there and, and find ways to be very touristy. But it's still difficult to get around. It's still a challenge. And I'm not like a super hardcore traveler. And so it was very, very challenging for me. And um, the language barrier was a thing. Um, I was having medical issues. Yes, I'm still having those. I am getting more clarity around them, but I don't really have anything to share. I'm still in a wheelchair. So yeah, it was really challenging to get around. I was using my walking sticks and trying to mitigate the pain. And then when it just progressed and became too much, I had to come home early. But All of this to say that as I was going through this experience, I was amazed at how well it was informing my character's experience. And I think it's really appropriate for this particular work in progress because it is about time travel and it is a thriller. So it's anchored in the 1920s, Salt Lake City, Utah. But then my character travels through salt flat portals to other times and places around the world. It's something where she is thrown out of her element. She's on this amazing journey. But yeah, more so than any other time that I've traveled, this was a really changing experience for me in so many ways. So that was very interesting to feel that strong parallel. And so that's what I'm working on. I'm, I'm gathering all the strings of the story and pulling them together and hoping I have the strength to tie a bow with all of them. (laughs) So you can beta read this baby at cindygrig.com. So C-I-N-D-Y-G-R-I-G-G.com. I am always looking for help with that. Audible is sponsoring this episode of the Story Punks podcast. Allison Johnson reads Nisi Shaw's Everfair, and she does a fantastic job. I can absolutely recommend it. And as you know by now, I do keep a running list of recommended reads for punk-related genres over at storypunks.world forward slash audible. Without further ado, 
I want to jump right into this interview with Nisi Shaw, and I asked her permission to use some content on her site as an unusual bio, and she graciously agreed. So I would love to share that with you. It's a little bit longer than usual, and it's definitely worth it. When I was little, I told my middle sister Julie convoluted tales of how I, a mermaid, had come to dwell in the small Midwestern town of Kalamazoo, Michigan. This odyssey involved the St. Lawrence Seaway, several of the Great Lakes, and the mysterious underground passages my school teacher called aquifers. Her own origin was much simpler, of course. Our parents, I explained, had found her in a garbage can. At 16 in 1971, I moved from Kalamazoo to Ann Arbor to attend the University of Michigan's residential college. I took several French courses, oral history, cosmology, and a poetry seminar that taught me 10 weeks of nothing. Most classes took place in the dorm, and I got a job in the dorm's library. One day, I was startled to notice an extremely short person walking towards me. They were less than two feet high. It took me several seconds to realize that this was a child. Anyone under a certain age had become alien to my experience. It wasn't this isolation that led to me dropping out of school. I had an abortion, I became depressed, I quit going to classes two weeks from finals, I failed to finish my assignments and left the university without a degree. I moved into a house called Cosmic Plateau and lived with people who called themselves bozos. I paid $65 a month rent. I worked part-time as a janitor, an au pair, a dorm cook, an artist's model. I wrote. I performed my writings publicly at parks and cafes and museums. I learned a lot. I read Charna, Ruth, Delaney, Colette, Wittig. I sent out a horrible story about fornicating centaurs and got a wonderfully sweet rejection letter. Then our landlady kicked all the bozos out of Cosmic Plateau and I had to live by the sweat of my brow. I worked at a natural foods warehouse. I sold structural steel and aluminum. I sold used books. I got married. I joined a band. I kept writing. I got better. My first science fiction appearance was in the nude. I modeled for one of Rick Lieber's illustrations for Bruce Sterling's Crystal Express, the Arkham House hardcover. I'm the dark girl of Telemed. My first science fiction publication was in Semiotext. See my bibliography for dates on this and the rest of my print oeuvre. I shared the table of contents with William S. Burroughs, J.G. Ballard, Bruce Sterling, William Gibson, and a bunch of less well-known, but quite cool, others. I owe my part in this literary conspiracy to Crowbar, publisher of the zine Popular Reality. In 1992, I attended a cyberpunk symposium in Detroit. Sterling, in his inimitable manner, supposed that no one in the audience had heard of Semiotext, let alone read it, and I was able to retort from the third row that I was in it. So I got to hang out with him and with Pat Cadigan and John Shirley, which last professional offered to read my stories. He was of the opinion that I could write, and he recommended that I attend the Clarion West Writers Workshop, where he and Cadigan were to teach that summer. At Clarion West, I learned in six weeks what six years at the university could never have taught me. Because of Clarion West and other writers programs in the Puget Sound area, Cottages at Hedgebrook, a retreat on Whidbey Island, I put Seattle near the top of my list when considering a move from Michigan. I'd gotten divorced, we'd sold the house. When I asked my ancestors where I ought to live, they said this was the place. My apartment is one block off the number 48 bus route. King County Metro takes me all the way to the beach. Gray and wild or smooth as oil, the water is unfailingly beautiful. By ways as circuitous as those I described to my sister almost four decades ago, this mermaid has returned to the sea. With no further introduction, let's get into this wonderful conversation Nisi, it's so wonderful to have you on the show. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for asking me. Absolutely. So in this show, we focus on the punks. As I've already introduced, we will mostly be talking about steampunk today. So I think it's really important that we keep talking about each other's definitions within this community. How do you define steampunk? What's inbounds, out of bounds? How do you define it? Well, I really like the um, 
definition that includes retrofuturism. And in fact, uh, I talk about Everfair, my novel, and the related short stories as Afro retrofuturism. Uh, in other words, we're looking back at the future, which is not necessarily a, as uh, a, as oppositional as you might think. I mean, th we, there are there are past futures and there will probably be future pasts. So let's just mix them up. So very anachronistic and mm -hmm. definitely it's, it's a global view, right? For me, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, in fact, that's probably one of the things that led to, to me being interested in steampunk was the idea that it didn't have to just be in Victorian England. Absolutely. Thank you. Because I have really enjoyed reading Everfair. And I think anyone who reads this or novels that are, you know, centered outside of the British Empire or that change history and how it went, but, but there's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree yeah. with you on that. Now, in addition, you also, you've written cyberpunk and solar punk and probably some other punks, right? Can you tell us yeah. about that and your interpretation of those? Sure. Um, cyberpunk, um, to me, that has to do with uh, being uh, sort of interconnected with, with uh, data processing machinery. Um, and I guess... Um, I, I have this series of short stories. That's a thing I do a lot is uh, put together a series of short stories. Um, I don't know that that's all that marketable. But anyway, um, one series of short stories I call Making Amends. And it's sort of a space opera uh, with a sort of a bitch planet twist, um, sort of a, a penal colony in the stars. And the people who are being uh, imprisoned are, hmm, how do I want to say this? They're, they're, they are living in a computer. They're uploaded. So uh, that story, um, a couple of the stories that I wrote about them are just basically taking place in this uh, uploaded reality. And, and those are classified, okay, as cyberpunk. Um, I did write a short story that it was a sequel to Everfair called uh, Sun Mountain and another one that was a sequel to Everfair called The Colors of Money. And The Colors of Money was featured in, um, gosh, what is that one? Sun Vault, that's what that's called. Um, and that I would say is solar punk, but it's also, you could call it um, hope punk. And I was at a convention last weekend, Confusion. We had a panel on hope punk, which is a broader category than solar punk. But solar punk is part of it, sure. I saw that tweet or a tweet about hope punk as the panel, and I was really impressed with the term. I love the terms, you know, eco punk, solar punk, but it's kind of cool to have the outcome be the part of the word instead of the tech, the type of tech or, or whatever. Sure. Sure. It's what we're going for. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. So what do you feel like each of these gives you as an author? So between steampunk or these other genres we've talked about, what is it that, that you love as far as creating? And I know that's a big question, but yeah, <laughs> when you create it, do you already know this is steampunk? Well, no. I mean, I was deliberately writing steampunk in Everfair. Actually, this kind of stuff, it turns out that somebody else classifies it for me, and that's fine. Um, but I did deliberately do that with uh, Everfair because basically what happened was I was in front of a whole bunch of people on a steampunk panel and I sort of dared myself to write a steampunk novel set in the Belgian Congo. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in that case it was, it was deliberate. Uh, as far as the 
question that you asked, I can give you the academic mm-hmm. answer or I can give you the um, giggling to myself answer. Um, I personally want the giggling to yourself answer, but do you mind giving us the academic one as well? Okay. So the (laughs) academic one is, um, I write this sort of stuff because it deprivileges hegemony. There you go. Awesome. (laughs) Nice long, uh, words. The giggling to myself is, it's a power trip. (laughs) (laughs) I can make the world be any way I want it as long as I write convincingly about it. I can get inside your head and make you think, well, that really could have happened. And why didn't it? And I think it did, actually. And that has actually happened with people who've read my stuff. They they stop reading it and they think, I are you sure that didn't happen? So that is incredible. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm going for. And I got it. Yeah. Well, that world building, I've heard other people describe the world building in your book, and I can concur after listening to the audiobook. I always listen to audiobooks. And I can concur that your world building tends to feel like a character. It's that vivid. It's that real. And I, I had that experience. So Oh, cool. Well, uh, as far as the world building being a character, the two people that I try and emulate in that are Raymond Chandler and Colette, uh, because their settings were characters. They were vivid and um, they had depth and, and uh, yeah, nuance. That's what I go for. Okay, so... For anyone who is listening to this for the first time, as far as listening to a discussion of Everfair, they haven't jumped in with it yet. Can you give us a high level overview or just whatever you would want someone new to the book to know? And, and I tend to like to hear about the themes when I'm investigating books. So if you could touch on that. Okay, well, themes, I think, are things that readers bring to the books more than authors. So you may be the one to talk about that. Um, But my sort of short version of of the pitch, um, there are African-American missionaries and Fabian socialists, uh, British sort of high-class, upper-class liberals who get together and buy land from King Leopold II, who had sort of decided on his own that he was going to become not just royal, but rich by owning a huge tract of land in the Congo Basin. He decided he was going to extract wealth from this area, his own personal fortune. Uh, But then he sells this land to the socialists and the missionaries who get together with a little bit of unease and form a nation called Everfair, which also uh, becomes involved in a war with Leopold uh, because it becomes a sheltering place for those fleeing his regime. And I, I could always uh, add a little bit about uh, what Leopold's regime was like and how he went about extracting wealth. Want me to do that? I would love that. Yeah. Okay. So Leopold uh, first went for ivory and then decided that what he was really going to make his wealth on was rubber. He had... Uh, entire villages of people going out and harvesting rubber in the in the wild, in the bush, in the jungle. These were people who were living in little towns, little cities, and um, little rural areas. And they were not just like living in the jungle, but they were sent out into the jungle to collect uh, this sap from trees so that it would... Uh, be able to be harvested and and used uh, in industrial processes. Mm. And in order to make sure that they got as much as they could, 
um, as much as he needed. He would give them a basket. He'd say, here's a basket. You fill this with balls of unprocessed raw rubber, or I will fill it with your hands and your feet, or the hands and feet of your wives and children. And he really did this. Um, I guess it's cheaper to cut off people's hands than it is to shoot them, save some bullets. So the rough estimate is that about 10 million people died in this process, oh but God. not in my version, <laughs> which I think is better. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, about a thousand times better. <laughs> um, but I do remember you referencing these ultimatums that were given to uh, to the people. And I... I think it's really compelling that you you found out all those details, obviously, and you have this alternate history premise. How how do you go about research? Because this is a big part of what a lot of the creators listening to this show are, whether they're doing, you know, whether they're writing or creating other kinds of art. But how do you go about research? How does it fit in with your creation process? Well, it's for me, it's an ongoing process. It's not something that I like scribble, you know, or type and I'll say, look this up later because everything that I find out changes what I'm writing in that minute. So people who are like cut off from the internet or out in the wilderness away from libraries uh, as, a, as a means of focusing on their work, more power to you, but that's not how I do it. Um, I do it with... Uh, constant checking back and forth. I'll tell you one thing I found out in the early stages of my research um, was that a bunch of railroad builders had, had escaped from Leopold's uh, project of building a railroad between the navigable stretches of the Congo River and the port. They looked around, they said, which way is east? Because they were Chinese. Which way is east? Okay, let's go that way. Yeah, east, there we go. And they never did get to China, but they did settle down in the Congo. And so, of course, I had to represent that in my work. And that changed everything that created uh, a character for me. Um, yeah. So... A lot of what I do is um, internet-based. I don't rely on the internet. I use the internet to find the resources that I need um, for a, a truly deep dig. So good. Thank you. And yeah, I know a lot of creators begin with the internet and then take it from there. Yeah. I agree with you on that. And okay, so one review I saw, or actually it wasn't a review, it was an interview they it was someone who observed that your your story ever fair it has this through line and it's a well it's a national story or a, i guess it's a it's a a society it's the story of a society right more than yes of individual storylines like there's there's many storylines within that right right and um i'm so happy whenever anyone gets that because people who are looking for like a uh, story of a hero, you know, overcoming odds. Okay, maybe there is one, but it's not a human being. It's a community. Yeah. Yeah, I found that really refreshing. I liked the pacing that it brought out. So, yeah, I don't see that a lot. I really enjoyed it. Of course, I didn't think it was anything special, but apparently it's not something that anyone was expecting. And uh, a lot of people were upset when they didn't get what they expected. I'll tell you another thing I've been thinking about um, recently because of uh, Ursula Le Guin's recent death. Um, she has made remarks in the past, so many remarks about how fantasy and science fiction often rely on war to solve conflicts and mm. resolve uh, conflict in the, in the plot. And I did my very best to avoid that uh, so that there are two wars arguably three in the book but they don't solve anything and that the actual solution to the conflict between the different parties involved in Everfair is a non-military one 
and that's that's on you, Ursula. That's that's for you. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for that tribute. I <laughs> I love it. It's beautiful. And uh, okay, so speaking of these themes in real life and how they affect, you know, the, what we write, and you know, you just spoke about war and how that affected that those observations affected how you wrote Everfair. Yeah. Uh, I've noticed from following you on Twitter that there are many announcements about different. I, I guess I wouldn't really call them, I guess I'd call them initiatives. I don't know. There's different groups that I see you posting about. Could you share some of these with us? And specifically, when, when there's someone who loves your writing, what action, if any, would you like them to take? Okay. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I do seem to get involved and passionately involved in a lot of causes. And sometimes I'm just, you know, sort of signal boosting for someone who's doing something individually, you know, hey, I started a Patreon. Sometimes it's an organization, like you say, um, I went to Clarion West, a six-week writing workshop. So I'm always trying to show people the best parts of that and how they can get involved. I uh, helped found the Carl Brandon Society, which is a nonprofit group that supports the presence of people of color in the imaginative genres through uh, uh, conversation groups, uh, awards, uh, scholarships. Um, for a while, we were the uh, fiscal sponsor of Con or Bust, which is um, a group that gets people to go to conventions when they don't have any money. Um, they give grants to people of color. So uh, they actually have literally changed the face of science fiction conventions in my lifetime. So those are a few of the groups. Um, and then I am involved in teaching, writing the other, um, which is about writing inclusive fiction. And let's see, what else? What else is there? I'm sure I'm forgetting a ton of things that I, you'll see on my Twitter feed. <laughs> yeah, writing the other is a book. So anyone can go check that out. Mm -hmm. And, and sh that, that's something Nisi wrote with was it Cynthia Ward? Yeah, Cynthia okay. Ward and I co wrote that. Yeah. yeah. So that's an awesome resource if you're writing about something that is other for you. And um, yeah, I've begun reading that. So, or taking a look at it. So, and there are exercises in there. You don't just like look at it, you like get your hands dirty, you do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Very immersive. So, very cool. Okay. Now, as we finish up this this interview, it's beginning of it, 2018. What do you hope to see in steampunk or other genres going forward? It could be wider. It could be sci-fi and, and mm. fantasy as a whole. I would really like to see more done with um, non-individualism, with, with uh, collective heroes um, and protagonists. Uh, I know that seems like a really sort of a fuzzy goal, but I'd like to see more writing that sort of subverts the idea that there is one here and they are, you know, going against the odds and going against um, their community to bring about uh, the best solution. Um, I, I would prefer to see something more... Um, many more stories that, that deal with how groups of people solve problems. That's kind a modest like, wish. Kind of like real life. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, no, <laughs> it, that depends on what kind of lens you're using to look at real life, right? It does. It does. That's why I love your response. And it, when you, when you were talking about that, I just thought, yeah, in, in that paradigm where there's one hero, everybody else is a sidekick or a villain mm. or something. And it's just, for me, it's not how life manifests, but as you say, it's all about your lens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's what people are looking for and that's what they see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really look forward to jumping into more work, especially interested in checking out 
Filter House. It's yes. a collection of short stories. And as we as we leave right before you tell us, you know, where people can find you, will you explain the concept behind that term that you came up with? Because I read about it. I thought it was fascinating. I know it has to do with marine biology, right? It does. Um, there are these uh, s- microscopic creatures called appendicularians, and they create houses through which they filter all their food. Um, so that's what's on the cover of the book, a filter house. Um, it's a, a, a large, to, uh, in comparison with the uh, organism that creates it. It's sort of like a 3D marine spider web flower. And um, when when it becomes too clogged to function anymore, the appendicularian drops it and creates another one. And the old ones become what's known as marine snow. And they're a vital part of the ecology. Oh, so cool. And I heard that this is similar to short stories and the role they play in our you know, ecosystem. Yes. How they act as filter houses. I love <laughs> that. <laughs> Just one reason why Nisi Shaw is so incredible. Okay, Nisi, where can people find your work? Well, um, I am in a goo gob of anthologies. Um, most recently, um, Sun Vault, which came out from Upper Rubber Boot, and I was in um, uh, Clock, Clockwork Cairo, which is uh, a bunch of Egyptian steampunk. Um, and let's see, what else? Gosh, I I, I keep uh, turning out stuff, and then it eventually it gets published. Um, I have a short story. Um, that's a sequel to an unwritten sequel of, of Everfair at um, the Slate magazine site. Um, yeah, there's a sto- short story of mine uh, called The Mighty Finn from my cyberpunk uh, short story series. Uh, the short story is called The Mighty Finn, P-H-I-N. Uh, you could just Google me. I'm pretty Googleable. Well, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. I really enjoyed that conversation. I hope you did as well. If you are enjoying these interviews, please share it with a friend. Just mention, hey, there's a Story Punks podcast. That is a really wonderful way to just um, loop more people in and hopefully get more people enjoying the podcast. And you can also leave a review. I know it can be kind of technically overwhelming just because of the way iTunes has it set up or other platforms. But if you can find a way to leave a review, also appreciated. And once again, if you're interested in some of the work I have been telling you about in my updates, then please go to cindygrig.com, C-I-N-D-Y-G-R-I-G-G.com. And I look forward to sharing more with you next week.